what do you see that's worth looking our way? We are free in ways that we never should be. Trinity Church, it's great to be together in the house of the Lord with brothers and sisters on an early daylight saving day. <laughs> so those that made it early, please join us. If you're at home, stand up right where you are and let's praise the Lord together. Let's sing a song. Love the Lord with all our hearts. started learning that very good i miss al carlisle he sets those up for us and he's been at home doing the covid avoidance thing which he has to but uh hearts out to him that, that we get new songs like that to sing you guys did really good for the first time around right second second okay well <laughs> let's continue to worshiping god we are loving him
so much. You set a relationship up that we can be called friends of you. That's amazing. We appreciate it. Amen. Please sit down. Greet people as you do. And I, I get to stand up here and, and, and say hello to you all at one time. Good morning, Trinity Church. Hey, it's great to see everybody on this beautiful sunny morning. To you folks at home, it's great to see you as well. Uh, it would be great to, one day to actually all be together here in the same place at the same time. But in the meantime, uh, we just have a few things as we share our life together uh, that we just want to bring to your attention. Uh, as you know, Easter is coming up very soon, the beginning of April. And as usual, we will be decorating the, uh, the uh, sanctuary here with lovely springtime flowers, uh, lilies, etc. And if you would like to purchase one of those flowers to put up here. Uh, today is the last day uh, to do so. So if you fill out one of these and uh, let us know uh, whom you'd like to remember when, uh, uh, when you uh, put these flowers up here, uh, just to add to the beauty and uh, uh, celebration of the, uh, the most uh, sacred day of the year. Uh, one other thing to bring to your attention, uh, just as a reminder, the week following Easter, and that uh, uh, would be uh, starting on Sunday the 11th. We'll start setting up for our uh, free store giveaway event. And uh, I hope or, or and trust that you're getting things together to give. And if, if, if you can, uh, bring those out during that week. And there are instructions on how to do that right here in the bulletin. And then as we approach the weekend, uh, we'll open the doors for others to come in and, and take those items. Or, and you're welcome to do so as well. But please, join us for our uh, free uh, giveaway uh, event. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact Sharon Deaton.
Our reading today is John 15, chapter 12 through 17. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay one's down, one's life down for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I am no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. We come once again for one of my favorite times of the morning, a skit to communicate God's truth to children, of all ages. So we finished up a series last week and now we're going to go looking towards Easter and the youth have a skit to talk from the theater of weirder things to what are the chickens trying to tell us. So we drop in on a quick interview. Pay attention. You might learn something from these chickens. My name is Arlene Bell. Welcome to Weirder Things, the show that explores the strange, the unknown, and the just plain odd. My guest tonight is a chicken farmer who recently found some strange and unusual things in the chicken coop. Please welcome Ernie Portnoy. <laughs> Hello, Ernie. Tell us about your chickens. Well, ma'am, there's not much to tell. They're white, they're fat, and they make a lot of noise. Okay. And recently, they sent you a message. Yeah, I think they did. You see, my chickens usually give a couple eggs every morning. What kind of eggs? Mostly white and brown, that is. Until the other day, I went to see one of my older chickens, Betsy. She laid here a colored egg. Whoa. What a pretty color. Yeah. Then this other chicken, Cindy, she laid another egg that looked like this. Oh, my. Then I go to the next chicken, Snowflake, and she laid an egg like this. Wow. I never saw anything like it in my life. Well, neither have I. As a matter of fact, those eggs don't even look like normal eggs. They look plastic. They are, and they have something inside. Really? Look for yourself. This one looks like a little donkey. And this one has a coin in it. And the last one here has a cup. Hmm, Arnie. This is amazing. Do you know what this means? I wouldn't be here if I did. Who rode into town on the back of a donkey? Who was betrayed by a friend for 30 coins made of silver? And who took a cup and blessed it and passed it around saying, do this in remembrance of me? I don't know. It was Jesus. Jesus is the son of God. He rode into a city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, riding on a donkey, like a king who had come in peace. He was be betrayed by Judas, one of his twelve disciples, who betrayed him. Why did he do that? Because Jesus didn't have God's plan in mind. He wanted Jesus to do things his way, the same way we do any time we disobey God's word. Judas agreed to turn Jesus over to men who wanted to harm him for thirty pieces of silver. Oh no, poor guy. What about the cup? Well, Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed and killed. 
That is why he took the cup and blessed it, saying, This is my blood, the blood of the, co- of the new covenant, which will be poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He knew he was going to die, and he was God, and he didn't stop him. Why? It was all part of God's perfect plan. Jesus took our place when he died on the cross. He set the perfect example of obedience by following his, per- his father's plan to sacrifice himself for us. It was the perfect example of love. Oh, I get it. And the cup is how we remember his obedience and his perfect love. Sounds to me like your chickens wanted to give you something to help you remember all Jesus has done for you. I certainly won't forget it. I hope none of my viewers will either. I hope you'll come back and see us again. You do? Why? Because we're just now at the start of Easter, and time, the time when we remember what Jesus did for us. I have a feeling your chickens might have more to share with you. Well, if they do, you'll be the first to know. We'll see you next time on Weirder Things. So I don't know about you kids, but I look forward to Easter as well. Not just because there's unusual eggs involved, like Farmer here, but because there is a story way beyond celebrating a new life here on Earth that he gives us for eternity. So pay attention. Good things are coming. Good morning, everyone. Before we go to prayer this morning, I want to make you aware of a, a few bits of information that we've gotten this morning. Um, John and Linda Cole, who used to attend here, and we love very much. Uh, Linda has uh, passed away as of this morning, uh, lost her battle with cancer. So uh, we want to lift them up this morning. We want to be in prayer for John in these uh, coming days, weeks, and months. As he's going to have a difficult transition. So um, Also, we wanted to mention um, Rich and Bev. Bev had eye surgery uh, this week. And um, I think there was somewhat of a complication and they had to uh, do something that they didn't anticipate. And so she is recovering, but at least for the next week, she's going to have to sleep in one position on her stomach. And, you know, I I personally know, I think we can all relate, you sleep how you sleep. So being told you have to sleep in a certain position is difficult and doesn't uh, lend itself to getting a lot of sleep. So let's be in prayer for Bev and for um, healing for her. And then lastly, I was talking with Carolyn Zadrovic this morning, and um, she was having some terrible back pain. So, you know, if you're praying this week, you think of Carolyn, lift her up in prayer that that God will relieve this uh, back pain that she is suffering from. So let's go to prayer this morning. Father, we come before you and just humble ourselves and acknowledge, Lord, Um, our weakness and our dependency on you, Father. We we acknowledge who you are above all names, above all things, Lord. And Father, we just pray and ask you to um, minister to these people that we love, Lord. We think of John and Linda Cole, and we thank you, Father, that Linda is no longer suffering, that she is home with you. And we take joy in in that fact, Father. But, Lord, we we know that this is going to be such a difficult time for John. Father, show us ways that we can reach out and we can support him. I pray that your strength and comfort would be with him, Lord, and carry him through this time. Help us find ways to reach out and let him know that he is loved and he still has a home here, Father. We think of Bevan Rich and just ask you to minister them while they are at home today, Lord. I pray that you would... um, Bring swift healing for Bev's eyes. Uh, Give Rich patience. Help him to love and care for Bev as she needs to be cared for. I pray that you would help her to be able to get rest and sleep, Father, even uh, as she's limited to that position that she must lay in, Lord. I just ask you to bring comfort and healing to her. We think of our sister uh, Carolyn, Lord, at home, and just this new pain that she's having in her back, Father. I just pray that you would... Even now, touch her body, Lord, that she might have some relief. Father, that she might um, 
draw near to you, draw in your strength, Lord. We just ask in a miraculous way that you lift her up, that you hold her in your arms, Lord. Let her feel your power and strength. Know that she is your child and that you love her. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are our God and Savior. We thank you for your presence here in the person of your Holy Spirit. Father, have your way in this service. I pray that you would speak through the pastor, that you would give him the words that you want him to say, and they would be received through ears that allow us to hear what you want us to hear, Father. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Separated until the veil was torn. The moment that hope was born, and guilt was pardoned once and for all. Captivated, but no longer. Thank you, Emily, for sharing that lovely song. And God's worthy of our praise. He lifts us up. And so if you'd like to stand right where you're at, home, places, 
Let's continue with a great hymn of the faith. The love lifts us up. Thank you. So the time clock changed to affect a couple people more than others. You notice that? Sorry. Does this mean I can go back to bed? No. no. We're here to praise the Lord. Let's do our best. You okay? standing. Let's continue to praise him with a chorus. It means a lot. Sit, walk, and stand. The places we stand. God calls us to that.
spirit where we have places missing in our lives that don't honor you point that out but God be at work in a way beyond what we understand help us to really be devoted to you we we thank you for that relationship that means all in Jesus name So if you are of the appropriate age to be in children's church, you are dismissed for children's church. And the rest of you are stuck with me. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. Having a little trouble with our tape this morning, but there we go. Good enough. It's so good to be with everybody this morning. I was concerned, you know, when you spring forward, it always means that you have a slightly smaller attendance. It's just going to happen, right? So it's just a matter of, are we just going to have, you know, 15% smaller attendance or 50% smaller attendance? But you all remembered, and I didn't remember, honestly, until yesterday. But I remembered in time, so that's all that really matters as we spring forward to get to celebrate the nice, brisk, sunny But a little bit brisk this morning, uh, morning that the Lord has blessed us with. You know, there are some truths in the Bible um, that that whether you're you're a Christian or not, right? It doesn't even matter. um, You likely still know those truths. So even if you're joining us today and you're not normally in church on a Sunday, whether it's online or in person, first, we're really glad that you've come, right? Right? Or even if you don't know the Bible all that well and may not even describe yourself as a Christian, there are concepts or ideas and maybe even verses that I'm sure would be familiar to you. These, um, for instance, think of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. Yeah, there you go. You see it at the football games for sure. You've probably heard Mark 12, 31 before where Jesus says to love your neighbor as 
Yourself, that's right, yourself. Or one of the favorite ones to be quoted, sometimes even by people who aren't necessarily true followers of Jesus, is Matthew 7, 1. Usually it's cited in the older King James kind of language. Judge not lest you be judged, right? So the power of these ideas is not in their novelty. In other words, they're not significant because they're new. In fact... Just a little disclaimer for this morning, I'm probably not going to say anything in today's message that will be like an aha moment for you, right? In fact, I'm going to argue the other way. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that there are particular concepts in the Bible that never, ever go old. There are concepts that we need to keep understanding and keep applying and and be reminded, be brought back to. And in fact, if we think we've mastered them, then we probably don't understand the concept. For instance, think of of the idea of humility. If you left the sanctuary today and you left the narthex and you ran into a friend and you asked them what was going on in their life, they answered, I'm so excited. I just got the book I've been working on for. For so long, I finally got it published. Yeah, it's about a spiritual trait that I've been working to develop in my life for the last few years. Check it out. It's called Humility and How I Attained It. You would immediately know that they probably don't understand the idea of humility. Because the more you understand about biblical humility, the more you understand how prideful you really are. So there are certain concepts where the more you understand them, the more you understand that you need to understand them. People who understand biblical humility never stop practicing it. Now that's true not only in the Bible, but it's true about just life in general. For instance, just last year, the nation mourned over the death of famed basketball star Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and seven others in a tragic accident. Maybe you remember that. And Kobe was relentless in his pursuit of improvement and always practicing. So he knew there were certain things he needed to do, and he was just relentless in doing them over and over and over and over. In fact, I read an article about him And it said that the janitor of his high school in Pennsylvania got so weary of opening the gym for him at 4 a.m., 4 o'clock in the morning, every day, that he just cut him his own key to the gym. So this relentless pursuit of what should be obvious and not new is key to a lot of different areas of human life. But it's especially true when it comes to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So John 15 identifies some very fundamental and basic ideas of what it means to be a Christian. You can turn in your Bible to there or in your device. If you need a copy of God's Word, it's on those tables in the back. And you can just hop up and grab one. Um, And if if you're a follower of Jesus today, right, if you've repented of your sins, if you've turned to Christ and you've invited him to be your Lord and Savior, this, this text is really like 101 basic Christianity. If you're not yet a Christian... What I'm going to explain to you today is what Christians are supposed to be like. And I'm sure you know some bad ones. In fact, you're probably sitting right next to a bad one right now, right? Because none of us have arrived yet. We're works in progress by God's grace. And so what I'm going to share with you today is what Christians are supposed to be striving towards, God helping them. And this command, this idea, particularly around the concept of love, is something that every single one of us need to grow in. And in particular, we need to grow in it as it relates to some specific people that I'll talk about. But let's stop, and before we get any further, let's just stop and have a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for this service already this morning. Our hearts go out to the needs that were mentioned. But God, we pray that in this moment, and we know that even our worship is something that you have to do something with to make it eternally significant. God, it is not because of our musicianship or because of our deep baritone voices as we read scripture that brings you glory. God, it's because you are pleased to do something with it. 
And so in this moment, God, I pray that you would continue our worship and be pleased to do something with our hearts. We're here in our minds. We're here, but now help us to submit to what you have to tell us this morning and what you want to accomplish in us. And we pray these things, ask these things in in your son's name. Amen. So last week I suggested to you that when Jesus says, I'm the vine and you're the branches, that essentially it means this. That for followers of Jesus, your mindset needs to be, I can do nothing without Jesus, right? And I hope that was a little sticky for you, nothing without Jesus. Jesus, that when you got up on Monday or Tuesday or at least for a couple of days this week, or maybe you were in a meeting and you thought, nothing without Jesus, nothing without Jesus. So that's kind of the negative perspective of it, nothing without Jesus. But let's talk a little bit about the positive side. In this text today, Jesus continues the idea of what it means for us to abide in him, and he applies it not in what we're not to do, but what we are to do. So instead of thinking of it as nothing without Jesus, today I want to switch your thinking and I want you to think of it like this. Everything with, everything like Jesus. Everything like Jesus. So if last week was nothing without him, this text is about everything to be like him. It means that Jesus is to so captivate the mind and the hearts of God's people that we act and live and are like him in ways that are just supernatural and surprising. In fact, the glory of what it means to be a Christian is that you find yourself strangely and miraculously becoming more and more like Jesus Someone says something negative and instead of responding the way that you used to respond, you say words that are gracious. And then, rather than looking at yourself and going, nailed it, spiritual, grade A, Christian, right? You look at yourself and are amazed at what God just did through you. Like, man, I can't believe this just happened. That's incredible. Jesus is clearly working in me. That the more you know about Jesus, the more enamored you are with him, and the less enamored you are with yourself. So today, we're going to explore this concept of what it means to abide by loving one another. So first, it means that we're to love like Jesus. Love like Jesus. I don't have a slide for that. You have to write that down if you're taking notes. Love like Jesus. Abiding in Jesus has to translate into tangible action. Abiding in Jesus, this spiritual union with Christ that we talked about last week is to be matched with tangible fruit, with real behaviors in our lives. So understand, Christians, being a follower of Jesus is not just a belief set. It is a belief set, but it's a belief set that works its way into how you act and how you think and what you say and what you do. So In verses 12 to 17, Jesus is going to tell us that the followers of Jesus treat one another differently. And then next week, we're going to learn how verses 18 to 25, that the world hates people like this. It's crazy that as the community of Christ becomes more and more like Jesus, it's prophetic to the world, and the world hates that. And so Jesus is going to warn these disciples, I'm the true vine, you're the branches, love one another, and the world's going to hate you. So he sets up what is supposed to be their expectation. In verse 12, we find this command. This is my command, that you love one another as I have loved you. So go like one page back in your Bible to chapter 13. Just turn one page back in verses 34 and verses 35. This command to love one another is not a new command in terms of hearing it for the first time in the book of John. Because we heard it in verse 34 of chapter 13 when Jesus had finished washing his disciples' feet. Look at verse 34. He says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So also you are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but there's this connection with their relationships with with one another and how they have been loved 
by Jesus. In fact, they can't love one another, or to make it more specific, you can't love one another rightly unless you know how you've been loved. And when you understand how you've been loved, then the effect of that is that you want to share that love with someone else. It's sort of like if you're at a meal with a friend or your spouse or your kids and you cut into this amazing piece of steak or chicken or broccoli, right? Like, I don't know. I'm just trying to think. I'm trying to get everybody included here, okay? Vegetarians or tofu, okay? Whatever you want. So you cut into this and you're like, oh, man, this is the best tofu I've ever had. What is your inclination? You got to try this, right? But it's kind of funny because it also goes the other way, right? If like you find something hidden in the back of your refrigerator and you're like, whoa, man, what is that? You know, that's, whoa, something, something done died in the fridge, right? So maybe it's a forgotten carton of milk or something, right? And, and we're like, oh, whoa, you got to smell that, right? Yeah, it's crazy that we, yeah, because I don't want to be the one to have to dump that thing out, right? It's crazy that we do that, right? But there's this relentless desire to share things, right? Some of you, if you found gas at a great price on your way to church this morning, you'd be so excited. You'd be telling everybody about it. Like, like I found gas for $2 a gallon. I found this. Can we make an announcement? I found this. Hey, I found this. The fact of the matter is that those who've been loved by Jesus, who've experienced his grace and his mercy, are inclined to share that love. So if you find your heart a little on the deficit end of loving other people, maybe last week was a, was a week where you just didn't do real well with loving other people. People, right? Maybe you found yourself being impatient or not very kind or kind of snarky, right? What do you do? Well, what you need to do if you're a Christian is you need to look at Jesus and be reminded of how you've been loved. And out of the overflow of that love, you're going to be able to love other people differently. It may be that you're here today and you have really big problems in your relationships or in your marriage. And the central issue may very well be that at least part of the problem is that you don't know how to love somebody else because you don't really know what it means to be loved. And so in your life, you've just sort of developed this kind of balance sheet of how to deal with other people. And you're trying to love others, and it's not working because you don't know what real sacrificial love looks like. So Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, That you love one another, John 13, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And then he says this, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Why? Because this kind of love is so crazy unusual. It's the idea that people would look at the church and they would see how we relate to one another. And they would just be like, what in the world? How does that happen? That you have people from very different walks of life and different gender, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnicities, different backgrounds altogether, different political perspectives. Like in the midst of the world that has all sorts of little buckets that we put people in, how is it that the church with all this diversity loves each other? And the answer is it's because of Jesus. So when the church is at its best, the world sits up and goes, how does that work? And when the church is at its worst, the world looks and goes, you're just like us. And that's why this is so incredibly important because Jesus is talking about a fundamental concept of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Go back to John chapter 15. When Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches, and he says, apart from me you can do nothing, what comes to mind when you heard that verse? For some of you, maybe it was, I can do nothing with Jesus, so I can't work without Jesus. Or maybe you thought, I can't deal with anxiety without Jesus. Or I can't share my faith without Jesus. Or I can't get an answer to prayer without Jesus. And all of those things would be true. But what Jesus primarily has in mind, not to the detriment of any of those things, but the thing that he has the bullseye on 
uh, on what apart from me you can do nothing means is related to the command in verse 12. That you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus identifies here that the way that we love one another is in reference to how we have been loved. And this is one of the ways that the gospel, this is one of the ways that being a Christian is deeply transformational. It means that when Jesus rescues sinners, he not only rescues them from their sinfulness, he not only enters into the mess of their lives in order for them to find a way to be forgiven, but now he gives them a taste of what true grace really is. So that those who have experienced God's grace are gracious to others. They're not just gracious to be polite. They're not gracious because they want people to be gracious in return. No, they're gracious because God showed his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus purchased our forgiveness by the sacrifice of his life, and those who put their trust in him are deeply loved and eternally forgiven, and they receive the extravagant grace of God. So, when you're dealing with a hard person, or a difficult, challenging situation in a relationship, rather than just thinking, this is hard, they're reminded, I was hard. Rather than thinking, this is annoying, we think, well, I was, and maybe sometimes even still am, really annoying. Rather than thinking, I'm just giving and giving and giving and giving, we're reminded, I'm a taker. I took and I took and I took and I took, and everything that I have is only because of the mercy and the grace of Christ. Verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone day lay down his life for his friends. That word friend is super important. We'll come to this in point two. We sang about it already this morning. But right now what I want you to realize is that what Jesus is talking about is the kind of love that looks like self-sacrifice. Of course, the disciples at this moment have no idea this, the extent to which Jesus is going to apply this, right? They're still a little bit oblivious. They're just hearing about these concepts. They don't have a category in their mind yet for Jesus dying, let alone dying on a cross. And yet this kind of self-sacrifice for the sake of others, this loving people as we have been loved, becomes the hallmark of what it means to be a Christian, So take your Bibles and turn to 1 John, near the end of the the Bible. John not only wrote the Gospel of John, but he also wrote these three letters or three epistles. 1 John um, is is five chapters, and then we have just kind of two short epistles, uh, little letters in 2 and 3 John. And what I would love for you to do sometime is just to read through 1 John, and you will see the parallels between 1 John and the Gospel of John. Take your Bibles, if you're not there yet, turn to 1 John and look at chapter 4. Because what John is going to argue is that if you have been loved by God, then you must love other people. And he'll suggest that if you don't love other people, then the real question is, do you really know what it means to be loved by God? Look at what he says in in verse 7, 1 John 4 and verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Why? For love is from God, and whoever, has, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Notice the qualification. If you're born of God and you know God, then you will love. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved, but that God loved us. I mean, that's really basic. And you just need to remind yourself over and over, it's not that I loved God. God loved me. He loved me first. Jennifer and I have this game. She's disappeared. But we have this game. She says, I love you, um, I love you, you know, more, right? I love you more. And I get to say, because it's true. Oh, there she is. I get to say, I loved you first. So, you know, there you go. 
And, and, and it says, so let me finish, uh, verse 10. In, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So let me just get to the brutal point. If the characteristic pattern of your life is repeated self-centeredness and you're not concerned for your actions as it relates to other people and you're callous with your words and you don't care what you do or just live life for you, you, you. I don't care what you've prayed. I don't care what you say. The Bible says that if love doesn't come from you, then you don't know what it means, what it really means to be loved by God. Does it mean that you do it perfectly? No, thank God. It doesn't mean that you do it perfectly. But if the characteristic pattern of your life is consistently all about you and everything in your life is revolving around this narcissistic pattern of me, 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 right? The fact of the matter is that you don't know what it means to have Jesus give himself for you. Not really. Because those who have tasted of God's goodness express that goodness in how they love other people. This self-sacrificial love is otherworldly. I trust that you know that the broken love paradigm that is present, of course, in our world, you're familiar with it, right? For instance, people love because it benefits them. People get married for this reason. I see this. I want want the benefits of marriage. I I want to be loved, so I'm going to love so that I'm loved. And then when they're not loved the way that they want to be loved, they're like, peace, I'm out. Because they really didn't get married in order to love someone else. They got married in order to be loved. And that's completely backwards to the way that the Bible pictures what true love is, let alone what marriage is. Which is one of the reasons, by the way, that Christians are only supposed to marry Christians. Why? Because then you're coming at the issue of marriage with the same sort of values. Because otherwise, you're operating with like two very different paradigms. You can't know how to love unless you know what it means to be loved by Jesus. In our world and in our culture, maybe you know somebody. Maybe you're like this. Like, you're hospitable as long as people are hospitable back, right? Like, you invite someone over to your house and you're like, well, they better be inviting us over or we're never inviting them over again, right? And maybe you keep score on your little notepad and then you put it in your drawer or something like that, right? And you're like, well, seems like we've invited them over six times, and they've never invited us over once. Or maybe you have a friend who does things for other people, but they always expect things in return. To be loved by Christ is to be loved in a way that you could never repay. And that should affect how we think about everything, including generosity, things like time and money. Listen to what 1 John says. Chapter 3 says, By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. He's talking specifically here about the church, and then he says this, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, and can you just acknowledge with me, we have very super creative ways for us to close up our hearts when we see the needs of others come in front of us, right? He says, How does God's love abide in him? Verse 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Here's what John knows. He knows what you know. He knows what I know. And that is, human beings are really good at talking a good game, but never actually delivering. Like, We're really good at saying, I love everybody. And then you see someone in need and you're like, man, hope that works out. I'll pray for you. John says, if you have, listen, if you have the goods and you don't meet the need, how then does the love of God abide in you? So abiding in Jesus looks like looks like loving one another just in the same way that Jesus did. Can you imagine? If Jesus said, well, you got a need, 
I could meet that need, but, you know, I'm not willing to sacrifice, right? I hope that works out for you. I'll be praying, right? And we share in this love that we have with Jesus. We share that love with others because we are enamored with the love that he has given to us. So how many really hard people in your life do you really have? When I say or read or suggest that you are to love one another, my guess is that you have people in your life where that's super, super hard to apply that to, right? And I know it's complicated And there's all sorts of challenges. And you may have a friend where you feel like it's just a one-way street with them. Man, I'm just loving them, and I'm loving them, and I'm loving them, but they're not that loving back. Maybe you have the heartache as a parent where that's what your relationship is like with your kids. How do you keep going in that? How do you keep responding graciously? How do you not become embittered and become angry and hold them off at a relational distance because of it? You know how you do that? You love them the way that Jesus loved you while you were still a sinner. And when you're heartbroken and tears are welling up in your eyes and you think, I don't know if I can do this anymore. You just remember how much Jesus loved you. And granted, sometimes there are important boundaries to be respected and carefulness that needs to be practiced. I'm not saying that that's not on the table. What I'm saying is, how do you love hard people? You love hard people by remembering how Jesus loved you, a hard person. What does it look like to love when it's hard? That's all of our responsibilities to step into spaces that are hard because Jesus stepped into the hard spaces in our lives. So we're to love like Jesus. And then nothing without Jesus, right? Everything like Jesus. Here's the second thing. I want you to see Jesus moves from an identity concept I am the true vine, you are the branches, to now this idea of the disciples being friends. And it's just amazing that he says the word friends. That's why that song is just a repetitive, I am a friend of God. I am a friend. The whole point is to get it stuck in your head to be called a friend of God. It's just amazing. The word friends could also be translated as loved ones. And so back in John 15, Jesus says this, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends or his loved ones. And then he says this, You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now let's talk about that because it almost sounds as if Jesus is saying, I like people who do what I want. And that's not what he's saying. What Jesus is doing here is he's linking who they are, his friends, with obedience. One commentator put it this way, and I found it really helpful. Obedience doesn't make them friends of Jesus. Obedience is what characterizes his friends. So obedience doesn't make them his friends, but when they are his friends, they follow his commands because of who he is. So we're not saying that Jesus is somehow coming down to their level. He's still the Son of God. He's still the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's using this term as a statement of affection for them. And he's uniquely linking it to what they know in terms of the Father's will. So Jesus is unfolding the plan of God. And he's told these now 11 disciples, right? Because Judas is already gone. But all the things that are about to happen. And they don't fully understand it. And Jesus is saying to them, because you understand what the Father is doing, I've brought you in and you understand what my mission is and what the mission of God is. That's why he says next in verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. So Jesus is changing how they would think about him and his relationships servants are told what to do, and they are to obey, right? If you go to a restaurant today after church, you're not given any silverware. Imagine if you said, hey, hey, I don't have any silverware, and the waiter said, yeah, I don't do silverware. I just do food. You'd be like, "Uh, wait, wait a minute. Like, this is part of the deal here, right? Part of being a server is providing what's needed. 
What Jesus is saying is friends are different. Friends are responsive to the desire of friends because of the relationship. Jesus tells them that he has revealed to them what the Father revealed to him. So the disciples understand what Jesus is on earth for, right? Now, they don't understand the full plan of God. They don't know about the crucifixion. But they're hearing things about Jesus' self-sacrifice, and eventually all those pieces are going to come together. And when all that comes together for them, they will transform the world. He calls them friends because he calls them friends because of their participation in the mission that God has. All that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Later on, they're going to hear this command from Jesus, go into the uttermost parts of the earth. And they'll be compelled to do that because they know him and because they love him and because they understand the plan. So, Just understand how remarkable it is that Jesus calls these men his friends. Believers are friends. They're loved ones of Jesus. Just think of this. Jesus set his love on you, and that's why he rescued you. He didn't rescue you because of the the good that you brought to the table, right? He didn't look at all of humanity and say, like, hey, that guy, he looks good. Let's bring him in, right? Instead, it works like this. That guy's got some stuff. We better bring him in. Because what we bring to the table are liabilities. We don't bring assets. The other thing that's noteworthy here is that Jesus chooses to use this word friend. It's so interesting to me that he does this. And it emphasizes the fact that the disciples had this unique relationship with Jesus. And Jesus is valuing the common mission the common love relationship. And I just want to ask you, do you have anybody like that in your life? A fellow Christian who knows you, who loves you, who can speak the truth of God to you even when you don't want to hear it? Who, can, who you can call at three in the morning and say, I messed up, I need help. Who would pray for you or can you come get me? Somebody who can challenge your thinking, somebody who understands the trajectory of your life and the trajectory of scriptures, somebody who knows what it's like to walk with Jesus and can walk alongside of you. The church was designed to be a place where friends gather. It doesn't mean you're friends with everybody, but it means that somebody who's a follower of Jesus knows you and knows you well. Some of you, maybe after this service, just need to go up to somebody and say, I want to thank you for being my friend, right? Thank you for being, okay, Um, like I praise God for you because the world is hard. The devil is at work and we need loved ones near us in order to help us in this journey of everything like Jesus. Now the final thing that Jesus says, it's, Rather interesting in verse 16, it's almost as if Jesus would be concerned that these disciples, having heard that they're the friends of Jesus, they've been brought into this circle, oh, friends, having heard that Jesus has revealed them things, revealed to them things from the Father, they might somehow get swollen chests, right? And, and they might think about how awesome they are. So Jesus reminds them, you did not choose me, but I chose you, <laughs> Like, can you imagine? Jesus just keeps moving these disciples from one thought to another, back and forth and back and forth, right? Jesus is consistently trying to keep them balanced as he disciples them. He says, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and you, your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So the idea is, is that these disciples, they follow Jesus, they they, um, they said, right, to, like Jesus said, hey, follow me, and they decided to follow him. But you need to know that their decision to follow Jesus wasn't the first move in the chess game of God. Jesus went after them. He pursued them. And in his pursuing of them, then they follow him. But if, we w- if he would have never pursued them, they would have never followed him. By the way, it's the same, the same is true for you if you're a Christian. 
All of the circumstances in your life, the things that happened, the way that you heard the gospel, the pain that awakened your heart, the gospel, right? God's holy, I'm not, Jesus saves, Christ is my life, suddenly boomed and blasted and just blew, you know, blew up in your mind and in your heart. And you were like, that's true. And you received Christ. That didn't happen on your own. God was pursuing you way before you were pursuing him. But to what end? In order, he says, that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So the idea is that you are loved. These disciples understand the mission. Jesus chose them in order order for them to go from there to reach the people who did not yet know him. So the idea is that those who are loved go and seek out those who who do not yet know that they're loved. So they're to go. And when he says their fruit will abide, he means those who will be converted after them, right? So here's how this works. It is that Jesus' disciples gather. They love one another. They focus on who Jesus is. Does that sound familiar at all to what's taking place here this morning? They're reminded about his grace And then they're sent out on a mission to find other people who are outside the walls in order to bring them in. True disciples of Jesus should never become content to stay inside their walls. And I'm not talking about literal walls necessarily. I'm talking, you know, into our spiritual comfort zones, right? God calls us into this wonderful family. He he covers us in this amazing love so that we can go out And pull other people in. That's what he's about. It didn't stop with you. It wasn't like, oh, well, I finally got that person in, so now we're good. We're done. Doors are closed. Nobody else. We're always thinking, the intent is that we're always thinking about people who are outside the camp, people who need to be brought in. Because, listen, we were once outside. And it's really tempting for outsiders who have become insiders to be content with insider living. It's strange. Think about it. When you first come to Christ, you're all jazzed about evangelism, right? But then over time, you kind of become comfortable with the Christian community experience. And you kind of live life in this little arena. And you're not really interested in going to reach people anymore. And Jesus' disciples love one another so, so that they can go out to, to those who need to hear about this love. He says, so that whatever you ask in the Father in my name, he may give it to you. The idea is that the, these disciples are to pray as they go and live on mission. And then he concludes, it's kind of strange, but in verse 17, he just kind of throws it back in. It's kind of strange because this was the main point all along. These things I command you so that you will love one another. In other words, love is the engine of the church. Loving one another, loving Jesus, then compels us to go out and talk with people about the king that we love and the people that we love. You shouldn't have to force yourself to talk about Jesus. You shouldn't have to force yourself to talk about your church. People pick up on that really quickly, right? They'll pick up on if you're sharing the gospel of obligation. You know, your arm's twisted, right? People want to hear the most glorious message in the world, and they want to hear it from people who have experienced it in all of its glory. Just think about somebody telling you about something that you don't really care about, but they're just super excited about it. You listen just because their excitement kind of breeds a sense of excitement about something that you could care less about, right? It's got to be real. So what do we do with this? A couple of things. Number one, friend, if you're hearing my voice today and, you're not, and you haven't given your life to Christ, if you're not yet a Christian, why not today? Why not become a Christian today? Why not confess your sins and acknowledge you need, your need of a Savior and realize that you don't, you don't know what it is to love until you've been loved by Jesus And part of the barrier that you keep running into so many times in life may be that you keep trying to do everything without Jesus. And there's no way that you're living like Jesus because you don't know Jesus. And that maybe what I'm saying to you for the first time is like, 
you know, I, I actually believe that. And that's what happened to all of us who became Christians. One day we were like, that's true. And God rescued us. Secondly, for those of you who are Christians, can I just encourage you to not overcomplicate the Christian life? It's as simple as living out the gospel by loving other people. Can I just remind you today, Jesus died for you. He loves you. And out of the deep well of that beautiful story, we're then called to love one another. So with the people in your life that are hard to love, right now they're coming to mind. Think about the people that are hard to love. Where do you go to help yourself by God's grace to keep loving them? You don't go to the well of, well, maybe someday they'll change or maybe this time it'll be better. I sure hope it does. But where you go is to the fact that you have been loved, even in your own messiness. And then finally, can I just encourage us to make our Sundays a place where people feel loved? I know it's more difficult with COVID, <laughs> But as you make your way out this morning, there may be somebody who you just need to stop for a few moments and just say, you know, I haven't really told you this in a long time, but I really am thankful for you. Maybe somebody in the margins and you can just need to, just need to find out, hey, hey, what's going on with you? Like, how can I pray for you? And then actually pray for them, right? Maybe somebody you're sitting next to, even if they're 10 or 12 feet away, right? Just to say, hey, I don't really know you very well. I don't know your story. And in an effort to encourage that, starting today, theoretically, I don't know because um, it was arranged this week, but starting today after the service, the fellowship hall is going to be open and we're going to have some goodies there, hopefully, and some coffee, I think. And um, certainly we need to exercise good COVID caution, I understand, but I hope that you'll stop in for a few minutes to connect with your church. Can we make Sundays just a place where love just exudes from the confines of this church? Because Jesus calls his disciples to abide in him, and that means nothing without Jesus and everything like Jesus. It means that the singular mark of what it means to be a follower of his is that we love one another as Christ has loved the church. We love one another because Jesus loves us. It's what it, it's what it's it's what it means to be a Christian. It's so basic and something all of us need to grow in. Let's pray together as we prepare to close our service. Won't you stand with me? Lord, you know the condition of every person hearing this message today. And I pray that even today you might draw someone to yourself to become a follower of Christ. That maybe today it just clicked. And I pray, Lord, for Christians to emulate the love of Christ in hard places with hard kids and hard employees and hard employers and hard co-workers and hard neighbors and hard spouses and hard roommates, Lord. Help us to know how to apply this love, especially in the context of the body of Christ. So help us, Lord. We need your grace. And we're so thankful that we have this example in the person and work of you, Jesus. And it's in your name, your holy name that we pray. Amen. power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain.
There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, 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 to break every chain. Sacrifice so freely given in such a price. Bought our redemption and now heaven's gates swing wide. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every Father, we just lift you up this morning. Thank you for this precious time together. Thank you for the life-changing good news of your love in our lives. God, let it change us. Let it help us. Not only to share your love with those who are on the outside, but God, to have continued love for those who are hard in our lives because we were hard when you loved us. God, we know it's a process, but I just pray that you continue that process in us for your glory as we head out today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today, Trinity Church. I think the fellowship hall is going to be open after the service today, so if you're just dying for a little bit of fellowship, you can stop in there on your way out. Go and be the church. You're dismissed. Hey, you.